somebody or some people went all out here, so we appreciate that. All right, before we start, let's take some prayer requests. I would like to give a prayer request selfishly first. If We are leaving Thursday to go to Lebanon, uh, Beverly and I with Grace Dental Medical Mission. Small team is going over to Lebanon to work with a church there. And I think we're primarily going to be in Sidon, is that right? Well, Part of the time. It's outside. It's like May May. Yeah. And, and uh, city so May. this is kind of different for us, a different type of ministry, but it's in a it's a church there. It's a good church that been wanting to have a medical outreach, especially since the economy in Lebanon has has crumb crashed. And uh, so it's not that people are poor, but the money they have is worthless. So nobody can afford medicine and uh, health care, so they want to have a medical outreach as an evangelistic outreach of their church. They've asked us to come and partner with that. We have some contacts. One of the guys in our mission who just left from Lebanon to marry one of our nurses and living in New Hampshire or Massachusetts, it's his church there in Lebanon. So he's our kind of our contact, so he's going with us and will be having a mission. So pray for us. We'll be there for 10 days starting Thursday. And I, we get a little nervous when we travel to that part of the uh, yeah. world for some reason. And, uh, <laughs> but we know that God's in it and watch over us. Yes, Lou. Well, we're going to a um, sort of a mission thing that we are not usually involved in. And it's going, the girls are going to sing for Trump on Saturday. And um, I, too, am a little because it's wide open on Main Street. And when I hear about Trump bringing in the Secret Service, I'm like, well, the kids are all going to be in uniform representing Trump. And mm -hmm. so I'm a little concerned. I just want to ask for prayer. Sure. That's July 1st. July 1st. It's Saturday. Yeah. Pickens, so. yeah. Who's that handsome guy? I don't know. I'm trying to get rid of him. <laughs> 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 yeah, that's a big rally there July 1st. Crazy time right now. Eva? I, I just put on the prayer request that Martha Dan's sister was not going to have the um, hip replacement surgery because of the break in they found extra places where the pelvis had been damaged. But now they've decided that they can do that operation and not hurt the pelvis. Good. So they're going to go ahead and do that, and we hope that's going to release the pain which she has suffered for many, 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 many months. So we appreciate your prayers to that. Okay. My friend, Ed, Ed has six months to live, and Teresa needs all the prayers she can get because his wife is not dealing with it very well. And neither is he, actually. And they are Christians. And, uh, and my other friend it just found out he has cancer, too, Dennis. Mm -hmm. All right. Got to remember the request. Yes, I have actually two. Um, our granddaughter-in-law, Abiol, had a baby last week. Oh. And yesterday she was rushed to the hospital with oh. serious infection. I don't know the details. All I know is that she's been put on heavy doses of antibiotics, and they will not release her until her temperature has at least been 24 hours. Yes. So she's there. The baby is with her mother, and their daughter, who is a little over years, with our daughter, and you know, and of course Daniel is with his wife. But yeah, the other one is a friend of ours. Her daughter and son-in-law. We're picking up their grandkids the, the day it was raining, and somebody hydroplaned and hit them head on. Oh. So the daughter has a broken pelvis, broken ribs, broken arm. The son in law has bleeding in the brain and broken ribs. Oh, so yes. they, they're believers, but just, you know, pray for them. And, and my friend, I mean, she's, she's in her late 80s and she's a wreck. Okay. Try to remember some of these, Charlie. Uh, <laughs> We said hello and he misses everybody mm -hmm. and just keep him in your prayers. Uh, he struggles a lot, you know. So just keep him in your prayers. Okay. We'll and he says hello and he misses everybody. Mm -hmm. yes. I just wanted to tell everybody that I think for Seth that uh, he, he passed in the South Carolina already. He didn't have to take the reading camp. And uh, I wanted to ask you guys to pray for 
individual people in Pakistan um, that are that hold children's ministries and that more Christians would not be so afraid to financially help those that are reaching out. And there's a lot of scammers, but there are some real people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. so, yeah. Sure. Yeah. All right. Linda, yeah. Well, I was just thinking VBS, all the little souls mm -hmm. that will be coming. Mm -hmm. Okay, That's, I'm not going to ask anybody to remember all those requests, but I'll go ahead and open us in prayer and try to remember them during the week. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to look into your word and to spend this morning together. We pray your blessing on Sunday school and also the other aspects of today and the preparation for VBS. We pray you would bless and guide and give strength and grace. We do pray for your blessing on the VBS this week, that it would be useful to reach uh, many people, uh, young people especially, with the truth from your word. Lord, other ministries were mentioned today, that uh, we pray you'd bless them. And then all the health needs that were mentioned, Lord, there are many serious health needs with injuries and poor diagnoses and uh, prognoses. We pray, Lord, your grace and strength be given to your people. And that even through these hard times, people would turn to you who might not, not otherwise consider their spiritual needs. So Lord, please bless and guide us today. We thank you again for your many rich blessings to us. We pray for those who can't be with us. Pray your blessing on them. Pray especially for Lee that was mentioned that you'll give him grace today also. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, Acts 23. Let's do a quick review and then we'll get into this. Today's lesson is, is not really, um, not a lot of theology and it. it's more a narrative, a story that we're going to go through, but I think it'll help us to see the big picture of what's happening here in Paul's life. So we are in Acts 23. If you recall, Paul has been brought before the Sanhedrin. Remember, Paul then uses his diplomacy, his tact to, uh, to uh, divide the Sanhedrin over the issue of resurrection. As, as uh, Chris told us last week, uh, the Sadducees and the Pharisees differed, so Paul used that to cause a, uh, a ruckus, and so Paul is rescued again. You notice in these last couple chapters, three times Paul is rescued from being hurt. Right? The first time the Jews from Asia came and started, they pulled him out of the temple and was beating Paul, so the, the Roman soldiers came and rescued him. Then he asked for permission to speak to the crowd. He spoke to them in Aramaic, but then when he mentioned that he was going to the Gentiles, they again got all heated up and tried to attack Paul, so he was rescued again. He was going to be scourged. He wasn't scourged. And then he was brought before the Sanhedrin, then the Jewish leaders were going to tear him apart, the Bible says. And so again, the Roman authorities had to rescue him. So three times they had to rescue him from bodily harm. And then we ended with verse 11 there of chapter 23, where the Lord, stood, so Paul sees a vision, and the Lord said to him, Be of good cheer, Paul, or take courage, for as you have testified to the facts about me in Jerusalem, so you must testify also in Rome. And this is actually the fourth vision Paul has in the book of Acts. Can anyone think back where else Paul had a vision or saw the Lord? The road, the Damascus road, his conversion, that was the first one. The Macedonian vision, calling him to come over. The third one was in, remember the Lord appeared to him and said, take courage because I have many people in this city. Corinth, in Corinth. Then this is the fourth time he appears to him to encourage Paul. That really shows us the humanity of Paul. His, he, was, you know, he, was, he was a special tool in God's hands, but he was a man. And he no doubt faced fears and, and trepidation. So four times the Lord comes to him. Well, that brings us to where we are in verse 12. And this is where we see the, how those Jews, how strongly they felt about Paul. So let's start at verse 12 and just read a couple verses. It says, When it was day, the Jews made a plot and bound themselves by an oath, neither to eat nor drink till they had killed Paul. There were more than 40 who made this conspiracy. 
This really shows you the intense hatred, how determined these Jews were. What in those verses tells us, shows us their determination? All right, I mean, the oath they took, um, certainly we'll talk about that. How soon after he was rescued does it happen? The very next day. The very next day they banded together. And it was just a couple guys, right? <laughs> this is over 40. I mean, it's, this is a substantial mob, and they were intent to kill Paul from the start. If you look back to chapter 21 and verse 31, it tells us there, now as they were seeking to kill him, talk about the Jews that came from Asia. So this is from the start. It wasn't just that they wanted to teach him a lesson. I mean, they wanted to get rid of Paul. They wanted to kill him. And it says they took an oath. They bound themselves with an oath. That, that uh, phrase, to take an oath, that's the same phrase, where the, the Greek word anathema. And the idea is that you're putting yourself under a curse if you don't fulfill that oath. That's how strong. This is not just, a, oh, we have an idea, let's just agree on this. This was they bound themselves with a curse, saying if we don't do this, we should die. Shows they were fully committed. Now, we're not told if this was an oral agreement or possibly it was put down in writing and they signed it. But actually, the commentator stated that this kind of oath with this wording means that it would actually require legal action to reverse the oath. So, I mean, this is not just a bunch of guys saying, let's do this. And it was, it was they were binding themselves to it legally. So they were serious. All right, let's look at verse 14. The next step. They went to the chief priests and elders and said, we have strictly bound ourselves by an oath to taste no food till we have killed Paul. Now therefore you, along with the council, give notice to the tribune to bring him down to you as though you were going to determine his case more exactly, and we are ready to kill him before he comes near. So they bring their plan to the Jewish leaders and lay it out before them. So what would you say about this plan that they have? Was it, was it pretty explicit? <laughs> was it, yeah, they wanted to kill Paul. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't just, you know, we'll see what happens, and it was, we were going to kill Paul. What else could you say about this plan? Wicked, for sure. Okay. We'll talk about that in a minute. It was it a bold plan? Yes. yes. Was it a feasible plan? Yeah. Well, it's for you. Yeah. I mean, think about it. Um, they they figured, you know, we have enough numbers, we can do it. But what else about this plan? Do you think was it a little bit risky? Well, sure. He says, "Pray for your enemies," <laughs> and you know, "Thou shalt not kill." Sure. But humanly speaking, was it risky? Yeah. I mean, Paul was not going to be out under guard, right? And Paul had already been rescued three times. Yeah. So think about what was probably they were thinking, what is going to happen. Yes, Pete, you're going to jump out of your seat there. Yeah. I don't need a whole or something. You're on the wrong side. Yeah. Well, I, I'm thinking that sometimes when people get um, in a hate mode towards something, they get totally irrational and, and make stupid yep. decisions. Fanaticism, that's what it is, right? They, that's what I'm saying. And they're talking about overpowering Roman guards. And these are trained Roman. Now, we don't know how many were, were going to be with Paul, but again, he'd been rescued three times. The commander has, is already a little bit shaken by all this. He still doesn't know what's going on. Probably it would have been a substantial guard. Now, you know, I don't know, 10, 15 guys. I don't know what they would have planned, but they were planning on overpowering Roman guards to kill Paul, realizing some of them might die. That's how fanatic they were. They were saying, look, whatever it takes, we're bound. We're going to do it. We realize we might get hurt, we might get killed, but we're going to kill Paul. So it shows how determined and fanatic they were about this. Now, it's not stated, but apparently the council, the Jewish leaders are in agreement, right? They give no argument. So what does that tell us about the Jewish council, the Jewish leaders. Corrupt, their base character, right? So they were willing. What does it tell us about what they had against Paul? Yeah, exactly. It tells us they didn't have a legitimate case. They knew it. 
it tells us that this was 100% emotional, political. It had nothing to do with truth or righteousness. Zero. Somebody said it was evil. That's exactly what it was. Some might even say Satan was behind this, certainly. I mean... We believe strongly that God, that Satan opposes anything that's done in, in, in the name of Jesus. And this is a good example of that. Yes? Oh, yeah. yeah. I've been amazed over the years, too, you know, when you'll be just talking to someone and wanting, looking for an opening to witness and mention something maybe about the Bible. And some people that typically are very calm, cool, and collected just go off. And yeah, it's amazing. So there is, there is spiritual warfare, um, no doubt about it. All right, so this is what's happening, and the Jewish leaders are in on it. So we're going to go through a little quicker because I want to get through the narrative, then we'll talk a little bit more. So next we see what happens. In verse 16, let's read through 22. Now the son of Paul's sister, okay, nephew, heard of their ambush, so he went and entered the barracks and told Paul. Paul called one of the centurions and said, take this young man to the tribune, for he has something to tell him. So he took him and brought him to the tribune and said, Paul the prisoner called me and asked me to bring this young man to you as he has something to say to you. The tribune took him by the hand and going aside, asked him privately, what is it that you have to tell me? And he said, the Jews have agreed to ask you to bring Paul down to the council tomorrow as though they were going to inquire somewhat more closely about him. But do not be persuaded by them, for more than 40 of their men are lying in ambush for him who have bound themselves by an oath neither to eat nor drink till they have killed him. And now they are ready, waiting for your consent. So the tribune dismissed the young man, charging him, tell no one that you have informed me of these things. Okay, interesting. So Paul's nephew, what's his name? We don't, we're not told. So, and somehow he hears of this, okay? And then he tells Paul, Paul directs him to the commander to be told him. Now he's called a young man. Where else have we seen that term? Not to, what's that? With Timothy, but recently in the book of Acts. Remember about a young man who had, had a little trouble staying awake in church? <laughs> Eutychus? He was all, that's the same term, young man. So pr probably teenager to early 20s. So it says that, but I, I think that kind of means he grabbed him and said, come here. Yeah, I don't know that it meant he, a, a tot. I mean, that throws you off, I think, but... The commentators say that that term young man really refers to a young adult. So, so it's probably a young adult. But what, what is this showing us, looking at it from the big picture? What's going on here? Is this a coincidence? Yeah, God is working, right? It really shows God's providence and sovereignty in all circumstances. Just last night, and I was going to read this, but it's too long, but just last night, Beverly and I, we, we always read a part of a book before we go to sleep, and we always read missionary books, but it's about this missionary couple in the Con in, uh, French Congo, and um, in the 50s or something. But anyway, long story short, they had a little guy cut wood for him all through his childhood. They kind of raised him, adopted him, and he left to go back to CAR, and, uh, and they lost track of him. Well, long, I'm trying to make this really short, so... Gene, the husband, missionary, had to go over to CAR to pick up his kids from a mission school. And the change in government came, and the, the, the ruler of the CAR became more of a dictator, pronounced himself king, decided to change the rules. He had to have a visa to come in. Anyway, he got arrested. And uh, he was taken to what looked like a very bad situation. And just recently, two journalists had been imprisoned just because they didn't show proper respect to the president who had declared himself king. So he was looking at being tortured, maybe being killed, and he was praying there in this little room waiting for his fate, and then he saw somebody's boots, and he looked up, and there's this African soldier looking at him. Comes to find out that was George, the little boy that they had raised. <laughs> and he had come, and because he had clout with the minister of the, of the military, 
he was able to see that this missionary got off and got a visa for life, which is unheard. Anyway, but it just showed God's sovereignty and control, even in, even in terrible circumstances. Yeah. You know, and, and you know, God, is, there's, there's always hope when, when you trust in God. That's the point. Okay, so we see God's sovereignty and God's um, providence in all this. What does this story tell us about Paul? Okay, listening to the Lord. What about people's reaction to Paul? He's a member. He's a prisoner. He had some clout, didn't he? I mean, they took him seriously. They, he just said, he called a centurion and said, here, this boy has some information. Take him to the commander. And the centurion did it. You know, I, I work in a jail. Um, I, you know, I do medicine in jail. And I just think, you know, if, a, if an inmate comes and tells a guard to do something, <laughs> rarely does the guard do it. Usually the guard says, shut up and get back in your cell. Um, but, you know, Paul had clout. And w- beyond that, we talk about his reputation, his testimony. And I think this really shows, remember, three times now Paul has been drug out, been beaten, been <laughs> abused. And through all this, he has, de- he has uh, established quite a reputation and testimony that people would take him seriously. Yes? Anytime you go before authority, you can pray favor as a shield. Sure. It's, it's, sure. it's, it's, now, notice when Paul was able to speak, who was he speaking to when he spoke earlier? He was speaking to the Jews, right? Does it, do we ever have any indication during this episode that he was witnessing to the Romans? No. And I got to thinking, it's, you know, that it, it's not that every time you're in the presence of unbelievers, you have to be hammering out the gospel. Now, we should always be looking for opportunities to share the gospel. But just the way he deported himself, the way he carried himself, the way he reacted was a testimony. And I thought, you know, that's, that is a lesson to us, that even if we're not actively witnessing, we are shaping our testimony among unbelievers. For, for, for right, for good or for bad. And that's why we have to be on guard and be, care, be careful how we live. Because people are watching. I, that just struck me that Paul really did have a testimony here. And they, they took him seriously. They were willing to act on his request. What does it tell, tell us about the nephew? Brave, courageous, integrity. You know, when he was brought to the commander, he said, tell me what you know. He gave a very accurate description of what he knew. So integrity, courage. What does it tell us about the commander? Yeah, thoughtfulness, integrity. He had courage to it. There it says at the end there in verse, uh, what, 22, that, um, you know, the tribune dismissed the young man, charging him, tell no one that you have informed me of these things. He was thoughtful. He was, he was already strategizing. He said, okay, I need to act. Remember, he's already on his back heels, right, with Paul because he almost flogged Paul, and he would have been in big trouble. So he's already kind of walking on eggshells, and here he's like, all right, we've got to handle this right. Yeah. So he was thoughtful. He was strategizing. He said, keep it confidential. Okay, so a lot out of that, but here, a couple questions come up. First, was the nephew a Christian? Maybe. He certainly was willing to help Paul. Um, how did he get his information? Some said maybe he was a, a soldier. He could have been a soldier. But what do we know about Paul and by extension his family? What was Paul? Pharisee. And he called himself a Pharisee among the Pharisees. So it's, it's not inconceivable that his family had connections to the upper Pharisees. So they, he may have been kind of a spy among the Pharisees. They had access. So, you know, it's not hard to imagine how he got this information. I mean, it's all, this all happened very fast. So somehow he got wind of this, and we're not told. And the other question is, did Paul's sister live in Jerusalem? I mean, the, son, the nephew did. So, and if Paul's sister lives in Jerusalem, why did Paul not stay with her or mention her? Who knows? 
Could be. I mean, we're not told, but that, that's just to remind us that, remember, Luke is, is telling this story. He's writing this letter. He doesn't give us all the details. He's given us the important stuff. But it does make us think, so where, how come Paul's sister's never mentioned again? And, but the key point is that God is working. Obviously, God is at work. Okay, another thing I want to point out is that talking about Luke's letter, and like I said, look at the big picture. How does Luke portray the Roman authorities overall? Pretty good, right? Really, Luke speaks well of the Roman authorities in general. He, he points out that in general, the Roman authorities respect Roman law. In fact, there's all through Acts, there's really no official Roman persecution of the church. Think about it. Where did all the persecution come from? 90% of it from the Jews, from the unbelieving Jews. Let me just read what Warren Wearsby said about this. I thought it was good. He says, throughout the book of Acts, Dr. Luke speaks favorably of the Roman military officials, beginning with Cornelius in Acts 10 and ending with Julius. That's the commander that was with Paul in the ship. There is no record in Acts of official Roman persecution against the church. The opposition was instigated by the unbelieving Jews. While the empire had its share of corrupt political opportunists, for the most part, the military leaders were men of quality who respected the Roman law. I thought that was interesting. Okay, any, any comments or questions about that section? Yes. Sent along the circumstances to Rome. Yeah. And he's showing how God is intervening. Oh, yeah. Paul is an excellent journalist. He really, I mean, Luke. Luke is an excellent journalist. And you're right. Think about this is a letter he's writing, right? And it covers a really a, several years of Paul's life. And he, he's, I mean, it's, it's a long book by book standards, but, and it's a long letter, but really, he really captures the important parts of it, and he does lay it out so that when you, we do get to where Paul's actually going to Rome, you can look back and say, good. Through his actions, he exercises personal responsibility even though he obviously believes in God's sovereignty. And the Lord told him he was going to Rome. He could have taken a more passive approach to what the nephew said so don't worry about the Lord so don't go to Rome. <laughs> but it, it exists together. So oh, yeah. We even see that in his writings where he strongly recognizes um, God's sovereignty the personal responsibility. Yeah. He doesn't try necessarily to figure out about, about how these connect because we can't really understand that yeah. in our finite lines. Right. lines. Right. And that's the thing. I mean, we can trust God and know that he is going to do what's best. All things work together for good. But we don't know how he's going to do it. <laughs> so we don't want to take away from any of, of God's possible pathways. And, and we certainly want to do our part. That's a good point. Let's move on. We see that Paul now, get, I mean, the commander coming up with a plan to get Paul safely to Felix. So let's look at verse 23. So the commander, then he called two of the centurions. Okay, a centurion is a, like a sergeant over 100 soldiers. He calls two centurions and said, get ready 200 soldiers with 70 horsemen and 200 spearmen to go as far as Caesarea at the third hour of the night. Also provide mounts for Paul to ride and bring him safely to Felix, the governor. Okay, so what did we say about the commander? What? He is still a little confused about what's going on, right? He still doesn't know what the deal is with this guy. He's probably getting more and more nervous about Paul because he realizes this is no ordinary thug, right? This isn't some riffraff. This is, he's a Roman citizen. You know, he's, he's not done any crime that I know of, but the Jews hate him, and they're going to kill him if I don't do something. So he's, he's a little bit um, on edge, so he quickly develops a plan um, to thwart the mob and their, their, their plan to get Paul. So now it's not only a matter of this prisoner, it's a matter of security. And what else is it a matter of? Him personally. 
his reputation, right? I mean, now there's a threat to his prisoner. And as you've been told before, in Roman military, if you let a prisoner go or a prisoner was, it doesn't reflect well on you. In fact, you'll probably be imprisoned or, or at best, if not killed. So his reputation's at stake. And he's going he's gonna to do all he can to make sure this happens. So he's going to take him to the governor. Now, the governor is in <clears throat> Caesarea. So if you look north of Jerusalem, it's Caesarea, 62 miles. And he wants to take him to Caesarea. That's where the governor is. That's kind of where the county, the, the government seat is. And it would be a much more secure location. He's saying things are getting out of hand here. Let's send him to Caesarea. It's a lot better place for him to be until we figure this out. What would you say about the guard that he proposes? Yeah. Pretty, pretty heavy. <laughs> so 200 soldiers, 200 spearmen. The best I could tell, spearmen were kind of like elite soldiers, like Green Beret, people that had extra training, and then 70 horsemen. That's a lot for one man. Isn't it? <laughs> Some might say he's, he's overreacting, but, and he probably is. But again, for the reasons we said, he's got to get this right. He wants to preempt the attack, either to discourage it, or if these 40 crazy people still try to attack, he wants to make sure there's no chance they can get to Paul. 470 men. And when's he going to do it? Nine o'clock at night, right? The third watch of the night, third hour of the night, nine o'clock under cover of darkness. So he is being very careful. He is saying, I am going to, I'm not going to lose this guy. I'm, I'm already in hot water because I almost scourged him. If they find out he is a Roman citizen and I let him be killed, that wouldn't be good. Okay, so that's what's going on there. Any questions or comments? Well, you know, that's a possibility, too. He may have recognized, hey, there are bigger forces than, <laughs> than just uh, people here. Very well could have been. So anyway, he takes a very, very strong measures to make sure Paul gets there. And then we see at the end of verse, uh, in verse 25, he writes a letter. He writes a letter to the governor. And this was required by a subordinate when transferring a prisoner. You always would send an explanation. It's basically a written statement of the case. So we're going to read the letter that he writes to the Governor Felix. I want you to think, what are the good points of this letter and what are the, some of the uh, bad points? Starting at verse 26. Claudius Lysias, to His Excellency the Governor Felix, greetings. This man was seized by the Jews and was about to be killed by them when I came upon them with the soldiers and rescued him, having learned that he was a Roman citizen. And desiring to know the charge for which they were accusing him, I brought him down to their council. I found that he was being accused about questions of their law, but charged with nothing deserving death or imprisonment. And when it was disclosed to me that there would be a plot against the man, I sent him to you at once, ordering his accusers also to state before you what they have against him. All right, so what can we say good about this letter? Do the point, succinct. I love, I love this letter. This is the way I write letters. <laughs> I don't do chit-chat. I just get straight. I just thought it was really good. He just says, greetings. <laughs> There's some people, I get letters, some from, from African pastors, and sometimes their greetings can be a whole paragraph, <laughs> which is really nice, but that's not the way I write letters. So it was succinct. Very good. What else? In general. Was it, it was respectful. It was, was, it was an appropriate letter, right? It was to the point, give the details, covers the essentials. What can we say about verse 29? He kind of shifted a little bit. Well, he just left some things out. Right. But what is, in verse 29, what does he state as far as his opinion of the matter? Right. He, he's basically stating, I think this man's innocent. Yeah. So it shows again his judgment. He doesn't know what's going on, but he's figured out so far that this guy is not, he's not a criminal by Roman standards, at least. Right. Well, <laughs> he's a commander, a Roman commander, what do you expect? Yeah. Yeah. Right. So bad. Let's talk about the bad, right? He definitely makes himself to be the hero. 
maybe not totally accurate, the way he says he rescued Paul. Since I knew he was a Roman, I rescued him. Not exactly. <laughs> right. He didn't find out till he almost beat him, right? So he left. He didn't mention the part about the flogging or the near flogging. What else? What else maybe is a little questionable? At the end of the letter, he says, when it was disclosed to me that there could be a plot against the man, I sent him to you at once, ordering his accusers also to state before you what they have against him. I mean, this is nitpicky, but I don't think he did that yet. Because remember, this is all secret. <laughs> and they were in on it. So, I mean, he probably was planning on doing that. Yeah. But, but he probably had not spoken to them yet. He was probably planning on it. He, th he probably thought, once I get him there safely, I'm going to come back and talk to the chief priest and said, you've got to go up there now. Yeah, you, your plan didn't work. Now you've got to go bring your case to Felix. So he may, you know, he may have stretched the truth a little bit, used some liberty, certainly made himself look good, but that's the letter, very appropriate. Sure. Well, he's dispatching his duty. He's saying, I've done everything I was supposed to do. Here he is. And uh, yeah, so this man, you know, no indication that he's religious or Christian, but he was a responsible Roman uh, commander. And like most Roman commanders, probably had a little ego to stroke. All right. Well, what I want to talk about a little bit here is what I mentioned before is that it's important for us to see that. Most of the persecution was from the Jews. Christians were generally not considered criminals by the Romans. Now, this is pre-Nero, remember. Okay, Nero changes when Nero is, comes in later, a couple years. But up to this point, and we have several examples of that in the book of Acts. Think back about in the, when Paul and Silas were imprisoned in Philippi, right? And then the angel released them and all, and they came. How did they, how did they part the country? The Roman, member of the Roman officials came and really all but apologized to them and begged them, it says, to leave quietly, right? And then what happened in uh, Corinth? Remember, the, the Jews came to Gallio and said, this man needs to be tried and we, he needs to be punished. What did Gallio say? He refused to hear the case. Okay, and what about in Ephesus? Remember the riot? Who, it was the town clerk that came to quiet the mob, and what did he tell them about Paul? He's saying he's, he's done nothing, no, he, he's not committed any crimes, right? And then in the future, we'll see with Governor Festus, who replaces Felix, and King Agrippa, both of them say, you know, there's, there's, Paul didn't really do anything. He'd probably go free if he hadn't appealed to Caesar. So all through Acts, we see that the official Roman attitude toward Christianity, the way they really didn't consider it a crime, it was the, the religious leaders that had the problem. And remember what we talked about, that the, the teaching of Paul was a what to the Jews? Stumbling block. What's another word for stumbling block? Offense. They were offended by Paul. I mean... They were wrong, and, but it offended them to the point that they, they fanatically went after him. And they were relentless. Remember, remember it says from town, when he would go to another city, the Jews would follow him, and they'd come, and they'd get the Jews together and stir it up. So, you know, looking at the big picture, we have to realize it wasn't the secular authorities that were persecuting the church, and Paul specifically, it was the religious leaders. Interesting. Uh, yes? We were never told whether those folks died of starvation and dehydration. <laughs> I'm sorry. I didn't hear that. The 40 took the oath. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, what happened to those 40 men? Well, that's why I said, you know, they probably were in a little bit of legal hot water because either they had to starve to death or somehow look for a way out. Yeah, I'm sure they, but they may have actually had to go to court, pay money to 
explain their case and to get uh, um, released from this. That's true. And it's interesting, again, that Luke doesn't tell us. But again, that's, you know, that's one of the things he left out. But uh, I wouldn't want to be one of them. <laughs> so good, good question. I thought of that, too. Wonder what happened to these guys. But yes, Linda. Issue with Linda. So. All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth that we find in it. Even when it's just a narrative of a story, we see your hand at work and how that you dealt with your children. And that We can take comfort knowing that you will care for us and provide for us. Help us, though, to be like Paul and willing to do what we can and to use the talents you've given us to uh, further the work that you've called us to. Pray, Lord, you'd bless us this week as we face a world largely is unbelieving. Help us to be a good testimony like Paul was. And we do pray for this uh, paper that Linda's preparing. We ask that you would use it, this one individual especially, that uh, they would, it would, you would use it to um, raise in them the uh, idea that they do have spiritual needs also. And they might consider their need to know you. So please bless us as we enter the church uh, service now in Jesus' name. Amen.